There's a little saying in the new town I moved to. Don't move here. I wish I would have found that out sooner rather than later. Unfortunately, I had found myself in the clutches of a messy divorce that forced me to move to this small town in southern Illinois, a town called Auburndale. That alone wasn't bad, I mean, besides the fact that I have to live in Illinois, but that alone wasn't the reason for the horrific nightmare that I found myself stuck in. My current trouble was on the day of my moving into an old house, built with two stories, but unpainted and signs of rot desecrating the outside wood. I had on my hands a nasty case of the fixer-upper, but that might be therapeutic for me for the time being. I needed to stop thinking about her and how she ran off with my brother. I thought perhaps working with my hands would be beneficial for me in the end. <laughs> if only that would have been the case. I went out to the back of the house and took a good look at the rocky cliffs behind, dropping some fifty to sixty feet. Down below was a beautiful stretch of trees that were already changing to the luscious colors of autumn, red, orange, and yellow. The crisp air was already nipping at my face, but I think I could work with this. Just have to get a heater for my bedroom. Nevertheless, I was going to have to get as much of the essential stuff running as quickly as possible. I got the house quite cheap for a reason. There was no electricity, gas, or any of the essential stuff that we needed these days. I was quickly worried about when I would take my next shower. If you were to ask anyone in town, they would say that the house was abandoned for all they knew. I had a battery-powered heater, which I hoped might last through the night, the first time ever using one of those, and I preferred to sleep in a sleeping bag on top of my bed instead of a simple blanket. It was all I could manage at this time. I also didn't want the gasoline I brought to get bad, so I left them in the living room for when winter comes. And just as I was about to fall asleep, I heard something outside. A loud, groaning sound that resembled the sounds of an elk pierced through the woods. But there was something completely off about it. The echoing never ceased, and it kept traveling through my house, as well as across the surrounding land. Never was it impeded by the trees or walls. Definitely spooky, but I didn't bother to worry about it for the time being. As far as I was concerned, it was the natural wildlife outside. After I finished making some instant coffee the next morning, I went out to the back to take in the fresh, woodland air. It seemed like the best kind of thing to do to get used to this new lifestyle that I had found myself in. Upon stepping towards the edge, I stepped on something slimy, meaty even. Hidden in the tall grass was the carcass of a mutilated animal. It may have been some sort of gopher. That I'm not too certain of, due to it appearing to have been ripped completely apart. I wasn't happy about this discovery. Already my new boots were getting blood tracked on them. God dang it! I shouted angrily. I was well aware that I wasn't going to get anywhere with cleaning them here. The best I could do was scrape the blood and meat off on the grass. This wasn't a pleasant sight. I was actually angry that something killed its prey in my yard. I'm gonna need something from that store to deal with this problem, I said. After I went back in to get ready, I heard something far off in the distance. Far out in the woods, making a wailing, shrill call. What in God's name? I went to the window and looked out. There was nothing. Same as before. At the supermarket, I was getting some raccoon repellent and some other supplies to help me fix up the house. Once I got all that, I stood in line, and immediately I ended up striking up a conversation with this man behind me. I see you're doing a little home improvement, eh? I turned around, trying to get my nerves that have been bugging me the entire time since I heard that sound. Oh, uh, these. Uh, there's a little sum to get that water system running. I believe I have well water. He chuckled and said, I'm Nate. I extended his hand. I did the same as we shook hands. I replied. 
Henry. So you mentioned that your water isn't working. Why's that? I, uh... Feeling a little self-conscious about mentioning that house. The one that's all dilapidated and an eyesore for the rest of the town when it's vintage homes that have been kept nice and well-decorated while mine is this rotten blight. I don't know. <laughs> you don't know? He asked again. Yeah, yeah, it's just... I don't know how to say this, but I bought the wrecked house by the cliffside. His expression changed so rapidly once I said that, but he asked again, clearly for confirmation of what I had said. You don't mean... Oh my god, they're still trying to sell that place? What's wrong? I said, becoming increasingly unnerved by this conversation's sudden turn. He told me that we should check out first, before he explained further about an old town legend in the area. Once that was over, we stood outside the store and talked. He had such a grim tone in his voice that he didn't have before. If I were you, I wouldn't stay in that place for a single night. You could offer me millions of dollars and I wouldn't do it. Uh, was that? The house isn't a good location, so to speak. There's been a string of murders tied up with it. Upon hearing that, I was agitated that the realtor didn't tell me about that. I already stayed there last night and nothing happened. It could be a week, it could be a month, hell, it could take a whole year before that thing in the woods just beyond the cliffside takes notice that you're in its house. Back it up. What thing are you talking about? There's a creature living in those woods, man. And when it finds out that you're inside the house, it won't be happy. I'd say trying to get that place up and running again is going to be a dead giveaway of your presence. Well, I can't live without water and electricity. He cut me off. You shouldn't be living in that house, period. If you don't want to end up in the obituaries and an early grave, I suggest you pack up your things and book it. I can't. I have nowhere else to go. The streets would be kinder to you. But I can tell you that there's plenty of motels around here that'll let you stay. Go to the Auburndale Motel down Westshire Avenue. The guy who runs the place knows about that house, and he'll let you stay for a few days for free so you can get yourself back on your feet without worrying about your pocket change. I took a few steps back, gripping tighter around my bags, and was trying my best not to look so visibly angry at him, but my face must have betrayed me in some small detail. He could tell that I wasn't happy and said, I live here. When you're ready to get out of there real quick, you can stay here for about a day. My wife might be a little grouchy, but she'll understand the situation. He handed me a quickly written note and took a few more steps back from me, concluding that this conversation was over. We exchanged goodbyes, but deep down I was hoping I wouldn't have to deal with him again. I'm not about to abandon my home over some silly town legend. Back home, I set everything down on the floor at the front door and went into the kitchen to see if I could cook up some coffee packets. I was going to need a triple-shot espresso for this day. I had a lot of work to do with the pipes. This was easier said than done. Once I had my coffee and started working on some of the pipes down in the basement, I struggled to deal with all these weird items from companies stretching all the way back to the 30s. Vintage Coca-Cola cans, an old tire wheel that looks like it belonged to a car from the 20s, and a bunch of other garbage that I wasn't keen on keeping around. Although I think the can of Coca-Cola might be worth something. Uh, once I got to work on the pipes, I took one off and saw that it was completely rusted through. Glad I brought the appropriate size for replacement. The real problem was how I was barely able to get any more pipes off. They were so rusted that a lot of them almost looked like they merged into one. There was also this sticky, brownish goo that covered certain corners of the basement. 
One particularly nasty corner in the front right of the house was set with an organized circle of candles and a bowl filled with that brown goo. What exactly it was, I wasn't itching to find out. Part of me wanted to clean this stuff up, in case it was toxic, but then again, maybe I should hire some professionals to fix my house after all. I was losing motivation fast to try and deal with all these problems, and I just wanted my utilities back on. I did give up and walk back upstairs to make a few phone calls in the meantime, but I kept feeling an unusual chill down my spine every time I took a look out the back window of the kitchen. For a brief moment, I thought I saw a light blink through some of the trees. It was already dusk outside. The sun had gone down, but the light was still partially there. And what was even more frightening was that it looked like as if the blinking light was getting closer to my house. That night, those words from Nate haunted me. I locked my door because at this point I was having second guesses about staying here. How I wish he wouldn't have told me all that stuff. But thankfully, everything was quiet for the first few hours. I did manage to fall asleep until around 4 a.m. I say 4 a.m. because that's when I was interrupted from my sleep by a piercing elk scream. I jumped out of my bed. A rush of adrenaline hit me quick. That sounded like it was inside my house, but I heard a crashing sound down below. Going downstairs, I was about to go down to the basement, but realized that I needed a weapon if I was going to deal with a home intruder. I ran into the kitchen to grab a knife, but briefly glanced out the window and saw something rushing towards the cliff. Once it did, it started walking down the pathway that led down. In its hand was a staff with a candle-lit lantern attached at the top. It was draped in a cloak, with a hood obscuring its head from my limited field of vision. From what I could see poking out from the hood, two long tusks that were probably a foot long each. But I could have sworn that I saw something else. Something like a mask. An animal skull mask. But it was gone before I could even process what I was seeing in deeper detail. After that encounter, I quickly called 911. As I was waiting for them, I wanted to quickly check the basement. Going down there, I didn't see any of the windows broken, but I knew that he came down here because there were pieces of paper scattered all over the place, as well as one of the shelves that was attached to the walls being torn out. Creeped out by the darkness down here, and worried about my intruder coming back, I went back up and stayed outside in the front, waiting for the flashing lights. A cop did eventually show up. He looked apprehensive with his sunken blue eyes and a large mustache like Joseph Stalin. Honestly, though, he looked as if he was the man himself, but he had three scars around his neck that his collar wasn't covering. Are you the homeowner? I said yes to his question and was expecting him to do a quick search of the house, but he did not do anything of the sort, but instead proceeded to lecture me, which I was not expecting. You decided to move into this house, huh? Hate to tell you this, son, but I already know that there's nothing we can do to help you. I was practically taken aback by the inaction and lack of sympathy for what I had gone through. Excuse me? Someone broke into my house, and you aren't even going to try and figure out who or how they got in? He rolled his eyes, and with a raspy voice that told me that he was already done with his conversation, he said, Did you see the suspect? Uh, kinda. What did it look like? Annoyed. The fact that he used the word it instead of him or them told me enough that this isn't the first time that the cops have been called out to this house before and that they are well aware of the situation. They, uh, they were wearing a cloak, I believe. Yeah, so like I said, there is nothing that we can do to help you. Whatever this thing is, it's beyond our ability to handle. You're better off getting help from a private investigator but I wouldn't count on it. A family tried that once, but they're all dead now. He spoke remorsefully. I wasn't able to talk back to this man. Frankly, 
he went back to his cop car and drove away. The apathy that I was experiencing was jarring, and I never expected the police to be so disconnected from my situation. But perhaps my intruder was something that the police were not equipped to deal with, and they decided that it wasn't worth the effort to even try. But that didn't make it any better, despite the rationale. Then I kept thinking about Nate. He told me something about how the town didn't like this house. Part of me felt that I should adhere to their fears about the home and jump ship. But I wasn't in the mood to try and start all over again. Maybe I should give it one more night and spend the day trying to figure out how that thing got into the basements to begin with. The next morning, I made it my mission to look around through the basement and figure out how this thing got in. From what I could remember, it stood on two legs and it was not going to garner any attention from the police. I wasn't in a position where I could move out immediately and I wasn't ready to abandon the house yet. I had already spent the money on buying it and I wasn't exactly keen on ending this. But no matter where I looked in the basement, I saw nothing except the piles of rubble and trash that littered and stacked up onto the walls. I spent possibly three hours just trying to look for something, but still, I saw that it was nothing but that brown goo and debris. I sat down on the steps, resting my head back uncomfortably, but having no will to try and go up the rest of them. I took deep breaths, my hands aching from hours of working with them. My god, this sucks, I muttered out in frustration. I took a quick survey of the room around me, wondering if maybe I was going about this all wrong. Perhaps there was indeed a hole nearby. I have thought that maybe there was a window that was cluttered over, but perhaps there was actually a genuinely large hole that the creature was crawling through. So I spent about two hours throwing shelves and bookcases around, trying to clear away as much as I could from the walls. And after doing all of that, I found... Nothing. I sighed defeatedly. Practically on the verge of tears, I gave up and went upstairs to rest in my bed. After all of that, I could not find any entrance as to how this creature came in and a part of me had another fear working its way into me. Would it be back tonight? I didn't have a gun license, so naturally I didn't have a gun. I was going to have to use anything else that could be a weapon to handle this situation to the best of my abilities. Something blunt or something sharp would have to make do. To ease my mind, I went out to the town to grab some more tools to work with and maybe even learned a little bit about my problem. Unfortunately, I wasn't ready to confront Nate about it again, so I guess you could say I went out to get a second opinion. I saw a church and knew that I could get some information from them. They had to have heard something about the house since the building looked like it's been here for decades, possibly even a century. I never liked being in a religious building, to me, there was nothing great about these institutions, but I was desperate and needed answers. Hopefully, the next shovel I got will help with searching for holes in my basement. A pastor noticed that I was looking around and approached me. Hello? Have you come to pray? Uh, no, that wasn't the reason for my visit. I just have some questions about some town lore. I wouldn't have chosen this place for something like that. The library is always open to those who want valuable information about the town. I know, but I bought the house on the cliff. I was hoping that you'd have some knowledge about its history. His face grimaced as I could see the creases in his wrinkles folding as he looked as if he was overwhelmed with a wave of grief. His voice, at first as sweet as any friendly, sympathetic old man, deepened into a serious and slightly colder tone. Get out of that house. He practically was ordering me. Why, though? It's not necessarily the house that is the problem. It's just that it borders on the realm of something evil in the woods beneath those cliffs. A monster. A being so grotesque that it wiped out all Native American tribes in the area. 
I sat down on the stairs of the speaker's platform and listened as he explained further. In the late 1800s, when this town finally was going up, a rich man who was also an owner of the opium trade going on in China built one of his homes on that cliffside, the house you currently inhabit. For a few months, his staff reported that occasionally they would hear something in the basement or in the attic. Then, on one September afternoon, a gardener said he heard something at the edge of the pathway and decided to go check it out. He never returned. There was no screaming of any sort. It was just as if he wandered towards the edge, entered the domain of the woods down below, and vanished. I was curious about the Native Americans, so I asked him about their story. Reports are sketchy. From what we know, they arrived here sometime in the 1400s. They only lasted about a year before their entire tribe was wiped out. They weren't even allowed to leave because a subsequent snowstorm ravaged the area and forced them to hunker down. During that time, their numbers were being whittled away by the creature in those woods. What is it? At this point, I was thinking that it would be something supernatural. This is a church, and this was a pastor, so I was expecting something that would coincide with his faith. It is not from Earth. It came from the stars and landed here many thousands of years ago, devouring any life forms that come within the vicinity of those woods. And I hate to say, that house just so happens to be too close to its home. Well, I definitely wasn't expecting a pastor of all sorts to give me that answer. I would have expected an astronomer or biologist to give me that answer. Maybe more so a conspiracy theorist. How do you know all that? He looked away, as if he was ashamed as to how he came upon this knowledge. My father took me hunting near those woods. We happened to get too close, and, well, that thing took my father from me. It ate him right in front of me. A ten-year-old. He was crying a little. I'm sorry to have to ask. But that's not all. As it mockingly killed my father, it also knew I was a believer and told me to give up on my faith because it was not from Earth. I can't say it was lying, but I can't say it was telling the truth. But it's been here for a long time, and we merely managed to outpopulate it into this area. How'd you escape? His head shook. And with a deep breath, he said, It let me go. Not out of mercy, but because it wanted me to live with the knowledge, I guess. Is there nothing I can do to get it out? Many tried. That rich man that I talked about earlier, his whole staff was eventually wiped out. He ended up gathering a search party to go into the woods and look for them, because the last thing he heard was that they were being dragged out towards those woods. The search party never returned either. Nothing and no one ever gets out, he said, matter-of-factly. I swallowed. I realized that I knew where this was going. Clearly, there had to be more to this story. How many people have inhabited the house before me? He stroked his chin for a moment and contemplated what he was going to say next. I could tell he was not comfortable with what he had to say. Dozens of people have come and gone. And by that, I mean they were viciously torn apart by something that hunts people like a ravenous animal but has the intelligence of something far beyond human. I believe I remember someone, I think it was the cop, he said something about a family. There have been so many people who were unaware, believing that they were getting a good deal on such a fixer-upper house or just flipping it, but in the end, they became nothing more than another on the list of people in the obituaries. After hearing all of this, I thanked him for the information and realized I had to make a decision. 
could I really go back to the house and face off against something that rattled everyone in this town down to their core fears? A monster that stalks and massacres any who try to make a home too close to it. Already, the day was getting late, and I decided to play a game of chance. I went back to the house to spend one more night. If I had another situation with the creature, I'll have to get out. But I'm going to keep all of my stuff packed, just to make sure. I still think I could keep this thing out of the house, if I could find out where it's hiding that hole in the basement. I kept poking around with the shovel, trying to see if I could cave in a secret entrance somewhere in the walls or on the floor. Still, I got nothing, and it was already getting late. There was no more light outside, and I was relying heavily on candles. I was about ready to quit, but I decided to take one more swing at the crumbling flooring. I lifted the shovel high, but accidentally hit the roof in the process. I had just rammed right through the floorboards on the first floor, and I was now really mad with my own stupid decision. Here I was, destroying my house further, trying to figure out if something was getting in through the basement through a secret passage that no matter where I looked, it seemed impossible. There was nothing. All the walls were solid. God, this sucks! I shouted in frustration, and started swinging the shovel down hard onto the ground. I kept chipping away at the broken concrete, until something caught my eye once my raging moment had passed. I lifted, and I moved closer towards a strange formation of different material that didn't match the aged concrete coloring. Is... is that a... It was. It was a skull. The lower jaw of a human skull. My heart was racing, and I was about ready to leave that room right then and there. Grab all my clothes, get out of the house, and go to that motel that I was told would be a safe place for me. But there was a vibration running through the floor, and all of the cans down here started to shake ever so slightly. Something was moving. I quickly ran behind one of the bookcases that I had pulled away from the wall and hid. As I said, I'm not all that religious, but let's just say that I was praying for certain this time. The room started to fill with hushed whispering. I covered my ears, but came to the horrifying realization that they were inside my head. When I peeked around the corner of the bookcase, the wall facing opposite to the stairs began to ripple like water. I honestly could not understand what was going on. But then, a long, skeletal hand pierced through the brick wall. Then the rest of the arm and then the whole body came through. I left my candles burning still, so I was able to get a good look at the monstrosity that stood before me. I'd say it was around six feet, five inches. It had appendages that were mostly just bonds, with only a little flesh keeping them attached to one another, mainly around the joints. But I did see something else. Whatever it was, it was strapped in black shoulder plating, a large gray robe that covered its leather under armor, and it had large, blood-soaked black boots. Its arms were long and fingers twice the length of a human finger. But even after all of this, its face was the most hideous part to look at. I was trembling just from the sight of its deer skull for a face, and where its eyes should be, blue light was emitting. It had two long tusks coming out from the sides of its lower jaw, and two long horns that were covering inwards towards each other, straight above its head. It started walking again, after taking its brief look around the room. I quickly retreated back behind the bookcase, hoping that it wasn't aware of my presence. It walked with a heavy clanking of metal boots, it went up the stairs, unaware of my existence, and it was scraping something metal against the rotten wood. When I peeked around the corner and saw that it had a long, broad sword in its left hand, I could hear it walking around on the first floor, opening doors. 
Now I knew for certain that it was looking for me. This was nothing more than a nightmare that I just wanted to wake up from. When I moved from my hiding place and was a little closer to the steps, I wondered how long it would take before the creature gave up. Then I heard it ascend to the next floor. I could hear the thrashing around of my stuff, and that is what was getting under my skin. It destroyed all my things, and now it's waiting for me. I'm not going to have it. I went up to the first floor, quietly. I then saw that I still had my gasoline tanks, which were originally meant for mowing the lawn, that I had left in the living room. With stealthy caution, I dumped the gasoline all over the first floor as quickly as I could. I was wondering what that creature was doing. I hadn't heard it since I got up here. Almost, I whispered to myself. Almost what? A deep, snake-like voice came from behind me. I jumped and dropped the gasoline tank. When I turned around, that thing was standing right behind me, lurking right over me. I took as many steps as I could towards the wall. Attempting to burn down my house. Pathetic. What are you? It moved closer with the clanking of its boots, making my heart jump with each step. I am the eons beyond humanity's time on this world. I ruled this world first, until your kind started showing up. You relegate me to my small dwelling, and occasionally try to take that from me too. But I will not yield. I'm sorry. I didn't know you lived here. I was on the verge of tears, and trying to plead for some sort of mercy from this otherwise malicious entity. It's no issue. I'm an outstanding fellow, but it just so happens that I have the taste for human flesh. Realizing what that entailed, the creature opened its mouth wide and was about to take a huge chomp out of my face. But I ducked to my left, desperately hoping to find the matches in the kitchen. The creature howled like an angry elk, chasing after me, walking like a man. That alone was bizarre. Once in the kitchen, I grabbed the matches and kept trying to swipe at one. One of them failed, so I was forced to pull out another one as the creature increasingly closed the gap between us. It couldn't run, I guess, or maybe it was just confident it could catch me. Either way, I had to keep walking backwards out into the hallway that exited out into the dining room. We briefly walked around in circles around the dining room table, the creature holding up its sword and smashing it through. Finally, I managed to light the second one. When I dropped it down to the ground, hoping that this would be it for this thing, I didn't think this far ahead. I was still stuck in the house. In a panic, I used my shoe to quickly kill the flame, hoping that didn't catch any of the gasoline. You're running out of matches. It laughed. He was right. I only had one left. We went back into the kitchen, and the creature relaxed a little. I was almost insulted by how it was taking its leisurely time with me. I desperately kept trying to light another one, but no matter how many times I tried, nothing worked. It was dead. A dead match. My eyes were so fixated on this creature now, I couldn't run. I locked the door earlier, and that gave it the time it needed to grab me and finish me off. It was over for me. The creature laughed some more, sliding its sword across the tile flooring, and said, How tragic. I will say you put up a better fight than most of my previous victims. For that, I will give you a warrior's way out of this life. It slid its sword very fast to give me a quick chop, but a burst of flame erupted in the kitchen that was slowly traveling across the floor. When I thought about it, scraping the sword against the aged tile, he must have ended up causing sparks on the ground without even realizing it. It cried out in pain as its body was engulfed in flames. 
I, on the other hand, spent no more time there. I ran for the front door, glad that I didn't have the gasoline over this section. Once I was outside, I was able to catch my breath and turn around as the flames quickly engulfed the dried up wood in sight, and that creature was still wailing. It was over. Everything was over. After the whole incident, I was able to file for insurance. I'm so glad I went and got this when I first got the house. The story I went with was that one of my gasoline tanks fell over and there was an electrical fire. Thankfully, that story was able to stick. With the money that I was able to get, I was able to just move into a simple mobile home in a different town. This was much better, and there was no cosmic monster that was living close by in this town, thankfully. Despite what I believe I saw, I don't think that the creature died in the fire. I went back about a week after the whole place had burned to the ground. It was late at night, and I was just wanting to have a bit of reassurance that it was gone. When I went to the edge of the cliff, I looked down at the forest and thought about how beautiful it was. I was rather melancholy about the whole ordeal. How it would have been nice to have woken up every day to see such a beautiful sunrise. But something caught my eye for a brief moment. When I looked down below, I could have sworn I saw a bright light moving under the trees, like a lantern flashing through the leaves, followed by the call of an elk howling. Thank <laughs> you.